Welcome back, everybody. Let's continue to talk about conformity. This time, let's focus on majority influence and also minority influence. Let's begin by talking about some factors that affect a majority's influence. So far, we've learned that people conform when they're feeling insecure and also when they sense that group pressure is intense. Well, there are four key factors that influence those feelings of pressure and feelings of insecurity in social situations. One factor would simply be the size of the group. Another would be whether or not the norms involved are salient or prominent at that time. Another would be whether or not a person has an ally. And gender would be the last one. Let's discuss each. So one key factor is group size, and that, that seems pretty obvious. Size, of course, does matter. That's based on lab research that has manipulated the number of confederates within a group. Once you get beyond three or four group members, there's just not much additional added social pressure when another person is added to the group. Because by that time, we get it. We understand what the group thinks, and it doesn't really help to make that point any more forcefully. In fact, at some point, people begin to see a cohesive group not as a collection anymore of individual critical thinkers, but more as a collection of like mindless followers who are really all in cahoots with each other. And that's why several small groups, like for example, three groups of three people, would actually exert more overall social pressure on someone than one large group of like nine people. And that's because in that case, the three groups would be perceived as providing us with better information from more independent, individual minds. Let's talk about the next key factor. We conform, of course, to social norms. We've learned that. But only when we're aware of them. So in other words, only when they're mentally activated. For example, consider some really neat research that was conducted by Robert Cialdini. He wanted to see when people were least likely to litter. So he set up a series of really interesting experiments in a parking lot. And what he did was create a situation where the parking lot was either incredibly clean or it was cluttered with debris. So a norm was essentially established just by entering that parking lot and looking around. You would either see that people don't litter here, that's the norm, or you would see that people do litter here quite often because the place is a mess. So this was a field study. The researchers were looking at people as they naturally entered this parking lot. And as people were coming back from wherever they were, they would notice that on their car, there was a flyer. And the question was, what would they do with that flyer? Because it was a flyer that they wouldn't want to keep. So were they gonna take that flyer and take it with them inside their car, or were they gonna take that flyer and crumple it up and throw it somewhere on the ground? And what he found was that when the parking lot was cluttered, people were more likely to litter. And when the parking lot was clean and that norm was activated and everybody noticed that it was clean, they were least likely to litter. Those results might not seem so surprising, but it's this follow-up study that's really very interesting. In this situation, again, he set up the parking lot so that it was either very clean and there was a norm established that people do not litter, or it was cluttered with debris and then the norm was established that people do litter here quite often. But he also manipulated whether or not they saw a litter bug. As people were re-entering the parking lot and walking toward their car, a confederate would meet them. And the confederate would either cross their path and go to their car and take that flyer and then litter, or the Confederate would cross their path and just keep walking. So in other words, all of the participants in this study, they either entered a clean parking lot or a cluttered parking lot, and they either saw a litter bug or they did not see a litter bug. Now, based on that first study, we're going to assume that people who were in the cluttered environment were more likely to litter, and that is true. But what's really interesting is what type of differences we might see between these two conditions. You might assume that if people see a litter bug, they're going to be more likely to litter. But actually, think about it this way. When people enter that clean parking lot, they see that a norm has been established that people do not litter here. Now, when they see a litter bug, that really draws their attention to the fact that somebody is violating that social norm. So what Cialdini actually found was people were least likely to litter in a clean parking lot when they saw someone violate that norm. 
So in this situation, seeing the norm violated made that norm more salient, and that had a stronger influence then on the participant's behavior. All right, well next, let's discuss the third factor that influences people's feelings of social pressure and insecurity. Remember Ash's line comparison research? In Ash's research studies, when an ally, a confederate, disagreed with the group, conformity rates dropped 80%. One thing that's very clear from a variety of different domains in social psychological research is that allies give us strength. You know this just from your own experience. It's very difficult to stand alone when everybody else is against us. And sometimes all it takes is one other dissenter, just one other ally to give us some additional courage that's necessary to resist the normative pressure to conform. And it's really very interesting. Any form of dissent reduces social pressure. So we don't necessarily need allies who agree with us. We just need allies who disagree with the group so that we're not the only ones standing alone. Other dissenters essentially validate our own dissent. This type of logic is backed up by the pattern that you'll see in Supreme Court decisions that have been handed down over the past 50 or so years. You'll see that out of over 4,000 decisions, eight to one votes where one person is standing alone up against the rest of the group, those are the least common type of decisions. So even for Supreme Court justices, it's hard to be a dissenter. Let's talk about that fourth key factor, and that's gender. In public, women tend to conform more and men less than they do otherwise in private situations, and that's partly because of traditional gender roles. Men, more so than women, are taught and are expected to be fiercely independent and to resist the influence of others. But, and this is a big but, familiarity influences conformity more than gender does. When people are insecure about some topic, both men and women, then they're more likely to conform with the majority. So if you put men in a situation that they're not familiar with and they're somewhat lacking in confidence, they'll be more likely to conform. Same is true of women. But you put men and women in a situation that they're very familiar with and they're very confident, they will be less likely to conform. So I guess the take home message here is that women in public are more likely to conform. Women are somewhat less likely to want to engage in some type of public battle. But privately, gender has much less of a role and familiarity is really the key driver in determining if somebody's going to conform or not. All right, let's switch gears and now talk about minority influence. We know that the majority is very strong, but dissenters can be very influential as well. In any given situation, dissenters are, by definition, really nonconformists. And unfortunately, nonconformists are often disliked and rejected by the larger group, by the majority. That said, they're often perceived to be competent and honest because they're fighters. You know, they're, they're standing up for what they believe in. I like to summarize those facts by seeing dissenters as annoying but respected by the group. I mentioned that dissenters can be influential too, and it's true. Dissenters, these nonconformists, they can score defections, which means they can get people from the majority to cross on over to their side by using certain strategies that maximize their minority influence. That term minority influence is simply referring to the process by which these dissenters produce change within their group. So speaking of minority influence, let's discuss Moscovici's theory of minority influence. It's very well known in social psychology. We understand that majorities are strong and influential by default simply due to the number of supporters they have. But nonconformists gain their power by the style and strategies that they use to influence other people. In order for those minority members to be influential, they must be forceful, persistent, and unwavering in support of their particular position. And that's because when members of the majority encounter dissenters who are forceful and persistent and unwavering, the members of the majority are essentially forced to take notice. They're forced to figure out, you know, I mean, who is this guy and, and what exactly is he saying? What does he want? And more importantly, in that type of situation, the members of the majority are forced to rethink their own positions and to determine if that dissenter might have some good points. That unwavering consistency is really important. 
Not only does it grab attention from members of the majority, but it also suggests that the dissenter is unlikely to give up or give in anytime soon. And that's likely to pressure the majority into seeking out some type of compromise. Now that said, the dissenter also must be flexible and open-minded, or the dissenter will encounter problems later on trying to reach some type of compromise. But there's a warning, let's be honest, dissent often leads to hostility within a group. And that's why Edwin Hollander suggested a two-step alternative approach that involves first conforming to the group and then dissenting. Let's talk about that next. Hollander's approach suggests that minority members will be most influential in overturning a group consensus if they first conform to that group and establish some credibility, and also what he would call idiosyncrasy credits. They're essentially brownie points. And then once the dissenter has established that credibility and connections and goodwill with the group, the group will then tolerate at least some amount of deviance. So that's the time then to dissent. Let's wrap up by talking about some benefits of dissent. If you think about it, we really need dissenters to make us better. Because if as a group we think everything is good, there's going to be no pressure to improve. So to some extent, dissent sparks innovation. Dissent will force us to scrutinize our own positions within a group, to think more carefully, and to think in new ways. So in other words, dissent can lead to higher standards. But dissent needs to be authentic for it to be influential. I'm sure you've heard about playing devil's advocate. And when someone's playing devil's advocate in a group, they're trying to take on the role of someone who doesn't agree with the group. And that might hold the group to a higher standard. However, what really tends to happen is that when a group member is artificially playing that devil's advocate position, it can actually strengthen the majority's position because they'll think that their current position is so strong that they can overcome all opposition. So without real pressure to seek a compromise, in other words, without a real challenge from a minority member, dissent from some minority member will likely fail. All right, my friends, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon. <laughs>